Psalm chapter 50 as we continue on. We're going to go through Psalm 50, starting with Psalm 50 through Psalm 52. So we're going to kind of move a little bit quickly, but these are kind of relatable psalms, and so I want to get through all three tonight, and we'll scoot along, and the Lord help us in that regard. So Psalm 50, simply titled, God the Righteous Judge. Now, this is a psalm of Asaph. This is a new writer. We have heard from David in the past. Then we began to hear from the, so the sons of Korah. And now tonight, we are going to be introduced to Asaph, a psalm of Asaph, Psalm 50. Now, Asaph is one of the Levites that was assigned by King David to write and to lift praises unto the Lord. Now, as we see Asaph introduced in the book of Chronicles, we realize that David, led by the Spirit, put together what we consider a worship team or a worship band of skilled, anointed, talented musicians and singers. And they're really one and the same when I say musicians. Singers are included in that, but sometimes some of the singers we've had in the past forgot that when I'd say, hey, let's talk to the musicians, and some of the singers would go, well, what about us? And I'd, come on, you, you know, <laughs> you know don't, you're part of that. You know, you're, the vocalist instrument is their voice, their musicians. So nonetheless, Asaph was assigned by King David to put these wonderful praise bands together. And Asaph had an ability from the Lord to be able to write these beautiful songs and to put together talented groups of musicians and singers. And that was his job. And King David expected Asaph to do it well. Praises unto the Lord should be sung and played well. To whatever ability that you have, you need to play to that high ability and sing to that ability, even in the pews. Lifting up our hearts, our hands, and our voices, as we often say. So in verse 1, Asaph begins, the mighty one, God the Lord has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. And so Asaph is saying, hey, we look at the earth. The earth responds to the voice of the Lord. Out of Zion, he continues in verse 2, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. In other words, out of the city of Jerusalem, God's city. Our God shall come and not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him, and that fire shall be very tempestuous all around him. Tempestuous, just a fancy word for violent or uncontrolled. So the idea through this song or through this poetry, the Lord is clearing the way for his presence to be revealed. So a tempestuous, uh, a, a fire shall devour, and it shall be very tempestuous all around him as he reveals himself. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. And now the Lord says, gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So the Lord is speaking to his people tonight, speaking to us, his people who have made a covenant. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. And there's that Hebrew phrase, Selah. In other words, just take a breath. God is good. I'm one of his kids. Now on the flip side, a warning a warning and God's desire for his people to return. So God has his people, but yet at this particular time, the nation of Israel had kind of turned their, their heads and turned their backs a little bit to the Lord. And so the Lord is, is calling them back and warning them, really. And in verse 7, he's saying, Hey, hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. That's a wake-up call, the Lord is saying. Oh, you're my kids, and I'm calling you into my presence. Yes, and you're responding, but you know what? It's time for me to get your attention. I need your full attention. I am God, your God. 
I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. So we're starting to kind of understand a little bit. The, the sacrifices are continually before the Lord, and so have they become just sort of a routine? Certainly. They surely have. They've kind of just turned into a tradition. Oh, yeah, hey, at noon, I got to just go burn a calf. You know, no big deal. Instead of saying, wow, Lord, thank you for the opportunity of coming before you, this, the sacrifices had become kind of casual. And we can all get into that position, can't we? I mean, let's just, it's okay to admit that. But this is the Lord because he's so good. He says, hey, I need your attention. You've been kind of falling asleep at the switch. That's okay, but you need to respond. Because, hello, remember, I'm God and you're not. And all of a sudden, that arrests our attention, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, wow, sorry, Lord. I have been a bit casual. Yes, I have. Verse 9, I will not take a bull from your house. I'm not interested in your sacrifices. If you're just going to bring them and throw them on the altar and not make a big deal about it, I'm not interested. I'm not interested at all. I will not take a bull from your house nor goats out of your folds. Why? Remember pastor taught us this the other week? During his teaching, for every beast of the forest is mine. It's mine, the Lord's saying. And the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and all the wild beasts of the field. Hey, guess what? They're all mine. So do you think you're doing me a favor by giving me a sacrifice of some sort? Please, with that kind of an attitude, don't bother. I don't want it. You think you're doing me a favor? Don't bother. For Get it. If I were hungry, verse 12, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all its fullness. I will eat of the flesh of, will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Is that what you think I'm going to do? I'm God. As Jesus told the woman at the well, hey, worship God in spirit and in truth. Jesus was saying, oh yes, the Father, he is spirit. Oh, I'm Jesus, God the Son in the flesh. And she, was, the woman at the well, soon got that information, didn't she? And finally it went off. Whoa, this is the Messiah. But previous to that, a couple minutes prior, Jesus was saying, oh, the Lord God will be worshipped in spirit and truth. Don't come and think you're going to bring some physical sacrifice and, and find him all giddy. Oh, look what you bought me. You know, that's not going to happen. It's the attitude. Cain and Abel. It wasn't the, the physical sacrifice. It was the attitude. The attitude. I'm not, I don't eat flesh of bulls or drink blood of goats. But offer, Asaph says, offer to God thanksgiving. Be thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Apostle Paul tells us, in everything give thanks. Why? In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What's God's will for my life? 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks. That's God's will for your life. Why wouldn't we? I mean, we're saved. We're born again. We're going to heaven. Why would, how do we not be thankful? Are you kidding? If this was it, I mean, if we had the crummiest life in the world and not all of our lives are exactly pleasant, but just the, the knowledge of being saved, I mean, that's enough to say, thank you, Lord. Wow. Are you kidding me? All this in heaven too? You, you, you got to be kidding me. Seriously. Offer to God thanksgiving, verse 14, and additionally, pay your vows to the Most High. So we offer God first thanksgiving, then our hearts are pure. Then we can say, Lord, would you receive this offering, this burnt offering for me? I know you don't need it, but I want to give this to you because I love you, Lord. This is my thanksgiving. I, I want to just offer this to you, Lord. And now the Lord is showing us that's how you sacrifice to me. You come with a thankful heart. And when you come with a thankful heart and then you pay your vows, then 
you may call on me, verse 15, in the day of trouble, and guess what? When you come with a thankful heart and you prepare yourself into my presence, and then when you call on me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Don't we love it when we gather up during the week on a Wednesday night or on a Sunday morning or a men's Tuesday night, a women's Monday night, whatever. We come in and we say, you know what? The Lord just blew my mind this day or last week or two days ago. And I want to just glorify God and what he did. That's what happens is the Lord delivers us and then we glorify him. We're going to see a little more of this in Psalm 51 in a moment. But as we continue in verse 16 in Psalm chapter 50, but to the wicked God says, what right have you to declare my statutes? This is the Lord quizzing the pagan. What right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth seeing that you hate, instru hate instruction and cast my works behind you? So if you hate me, promise you don't have a covenant with me, the Lord is saying. When you saw a, a thief, verse 18, you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers. Totally contrary to my direction. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. Once again, we're going to see this in Psalm chapter 53 in a few moments. But let's continue on for now in verse 20. You sit and speak against your brother. Yeah, man, you slander your own mother's son. Your own brother you talk against. Your flesh and blood. These things you have done, and yet I, the Lord speaking, I have kept silent. I've been observing, but I've kept silent. Never forget, God is a gentleman. But Peter tells us, don't take that casually. Don't take that casually. These things you have done and I have kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you. You thought I was like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. In other words, I will set in order your foolishness. I'll set in order your folly shortly. But I've been very patient. I've been waiting for you to come to your senses. But there'll, there'll be a time that comes that I will set your nonsense in order. And that's not going to be a happy day speaking to the pagan. It's not going to be a happy day for you. Therefore, now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you into pieces and there be none to deliver you. The Lord is trying to say, hey, you that, that hate me, I'm trying to get your attention also. Oh, I've called my, my children in. I've rebuked them, but I'm also trying to, to arrest your attention also. Consider these things, the Lord is saying. In the book of Isaiah, I love what the Lord says through the, the mouth of Isaiah, come now. Let us reason together. Let's you and I read. I mean, I'm God, but I'm willing to sit down with my creation and reason with you. That is a patient, kind, long-suffering, gentle God, if we've ever considered that. We couldn't invent Yahweh. Impossible. As the Lord says, I just imagine, I mean, when I read that in Isaiah, Isaiah 1, he says, you know, I just imagine the Lord says, here, come on, sit down for a second. Come on, take a break. Cool it for a minute. Would you like a cup of coffee? You know, whatever. Come now, let us reason together. That's our Lord. That is incredible. Let us reason together. Your sins are like scarlet. But yet I, if you want me to, I have the ability to wash them and to wash you as white as snow. Wow. There's no way we can invent that. Not in this little pea brain, we couldn't invent that. We invent gods that demand. They want, they require, this is what I want. But God says, hey, let's just reason. Can we take a minute? Well, Joan says, hey, can we talk? 
Come now, let us reason. Consider these things. Yet, in verse 23, whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. When we're searching for the salvation of God, when we hit the bottom of the barrel, and there was nowhere to look but up, when we looked up and cried out to God, who met us? The Lord himself. Because we sought him, and the minute we did that, Truthfully, with our hearts, he met us right there. He picked us up out of that miry pit and he even stood us on a solid rock, didn't he? Let us reason together. I think that's reasonable. His conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. Asaph, speaking to us tonight in Psalm 50, call upon me and I will deliver. What a blessing. Let's move on to Psalm 51. Now this is a prayer of repentance from King David to the chief musician. And again, this is a Psalm of David. Psalm 51. I think most of us are fairly familiar with this, but let's pick up at verse 1. David crying out. We just heard from Asaph, hey, Repent and come to the Lord and he'll hear you. And here David is crying out in verse 1, Psalm 51, have mercy upon me. Lord, you have your mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So what are we seeing here? Lord, your mercy in verse one. Likewise in verse one, your loving kindness, Lord. The multitude of your tender mercies, Lord. David is not offering any excuses or any nonsense. He says, Lord, I'm counting on your goodness. Wash me, Lord. You, I'm the one that needs cleansing, Lord. Wash me from my iniquity. It's not your fault. It's not because this is the way you made me. Lord, it's my iniquity. Wash me and cleanse me from my sin. David is calling his activity, and we'll see a little more in a minute. David is calling his activity with Bathsheba. He is calling it his sin. I'm the one that did it. It wasn't her. It wasn't this, and it wasn't that, and it wasn't the other thing. Lord, it was my sin. That's how we come before the Lord. Lord, I messed up, and I need you. Cleanse me from my sin. Verse 3, for I acknowledge. This is a humble David. This is a humble king. I acknowledge my transgressions. The king was the king. I mean, we've got very casual relationships right now. I mean, we have a a president that actually tweets and things, and that's all fine and good. But in these days, the king, I mean, the king could have your head removed just by thinking you could come into his presence. We see that clearly in the book of Esther as we had gone through Esther. I mean, the king's wife was praying to God, Lord, if I come into the king's presence, Lord, he, I'm hoping he'll accept my, my presence or he could easily have my head taken off. It was for security reasons. You didn't just go winging into the king's parlor, if you will, for security reasons. And instantly, if the king was startled or something, if I came around the hallway and there was the king at the end of the hallway and and whatnot, and I wasn't invited into his presence and he was startled, he could instantly have me killed like that for security reasons. So we understand why this is going on. But here, David, King David is acknowledging. He is prostrate. He's saying, you know, I am the king. Yeah, I can do just about anything I want, but Lord, I've sinned against you. And here's a man, a humble man, King David, a man after God's own heart, because he knew how to repent. 
Now, he was a human being, just like each and every one of us. But what made him different and makes him an example is that he was willing to humble himself, fall on his face, and ask the Lord for the tender mercies of God. I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. My activity with Bathsheba, impregnating her, secondly, sending her husband into the heat of the battle and having him murdered to try to cover my sin. Lord, I can't get away from it. You know it and I know it. And now I need to verbalize it. My sin is always before for me. Verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. I haven't hidden a thing from you. It has been done in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. You're omniscient, Lord. In other words, God knows everything, and David knew it. And he tried to duck out from his sin, and he couldn't. And David just ran out of space. And Nathaniel, the prophet, came in and said, David, the Lord knows every second of your life. And he busted David, and David just fell apart. He said, I'm busted. My only chance is, my only hope is to repent and call upon God's goodness. That's my only hope. And then I pray that his tender mercies would be released, but I don't deserve them. David knew that. He knew that. I don't deserve them. But my only hope is to fall on the Lord. David goes on, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. David was saying, the second I was born, I was a sinner. I was born a sinner. We can recognize that when we put two toddlers together. They don't even know how to talk, do they? But they sure know how to grab that toy out of their partner's hand, don't they? Now, who had to teach your kids to do that? Anybody? Okay, when he gets the, the Tonka toy, you take it from him. You didn't have to teach that child that at all. When that other child had that ball, that red ball, oh, here comes junior number two. I want that. Right? Elbow, bang, boom, hip. Oh, I got it. We're all born sinners. We're all born sinners. I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother conceived me. The minute I was born, I was a sinner. And no one had to teach me that. It's because of Adam's sin. When we get back into the book of Romans in the next couple of weeks, we're going to start looking at that. Adam introduced sin into the world. Jesus Christ came. And through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we are cleansed from sin. Through faith. We receive the grace. And we'll get back to that in a couple of weeks after we get back into Romans. So David knew. He said, the minute I was born, I was born a sinner. And that's my, that's my only reality. I'm no good. I have nothing good. Nothing good is within me, Lord. Nothing, David is crying out. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the inward part you will make me to know wisdom. You know my heart, Lord. You know my mind. And that's scary, isn't it? How many times are we sitting in church and all of a sudden we have an idea or a thought pass by and we kind of go, wow, where did that come from? It's just the way our, our minds are. It's the flesh. We've got to take hold of those thoughts and take them hold of Take them captivity in the name of Christ and put them down. So behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the inward part you will make me to know wisdom. Verse 7, purge me, Lord. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, Lord, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Let me respond to your correction, Lord. You've got my attention, now let me respond wholeheartedly. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Lord, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 
Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Man, King Saul had the Holy Spirit removed from him. And many theologians, many scholars believe that Saul probably was, was losing it mentally. That's the belief. That he was literally losing his mind as Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind for seven years. The king of Babylon. In other words, the king of the world. The Lord said, you know, Nebi, I put up and I also take down. And Nebuchadnezzar got the message after seven years. And once God restored Nebuchadnezzar's mind, Nebuchadnezzar just raised his hands and praised the Lord and said, thank you, Lord. I am but flesh, but you are God. And that's all David is saying here. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. What would I do? Restore to me, verse 12, the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. It's nothing that I'm going to do. It's all you, Lord. You do it. David's a wise man here, and we're wise to sit under his spirit-led teachings night after night, day after day. When this happens, when you restore me, Lord God, verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners shall be converted to you. Connie and I just got invited last night to the cops and clergy of Harupa Valley gathering. It's uh, obviously it's the police officers, the local sheriff here in Harupa Valley, and then the uh, the the community of churches. And there was all kinds of representatives there. But what we really enjoyed was the hand. I mean, there was 20, 30 people there, but there was only about three or four born again, spirit filled men representing their churches. And, uh, and we were one of those, thankfully. I mean, I know you believe that, right? I trust. <laughs> but it was great as we kind of went around the room and began the discussion and we got to know one another and things and enjoying ourselves, getting to know the captain uh, of the sheriff's department and some of his lieutenants, great folks, great men and women. And the guys that were spirit-filled, after we went around the room a couple of times and the spirited conversation began, the born-again guys stood up and says, you know, we realize that we have a homeless problem or, or whatever, or, or we realize that we have a, a domestic violence problem, you know, in our, in our city, except, you know, we, we recognize their sin, in other words, is what these men were saying. But each one of these guys was saying, but you know how that gets changed? That gets changed with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Connie and I are in the back of the room just going, yeah, because there's, here are these, there's wonderful people. But they're county people trying to put band-aid fixes on human lives. And they're thinking, well, if we build more houses, that'll take care of it. No, it won't. Well, if we give neater looking bags in the bag lunches, that'll be better when we hand them out on the sidewalk. It's not going to help anything. Oh, it'll, be, it'll fill a temporary need, yes. But long term... The only way people change is when they're introduced to Christ and they receive him. And that's what all the spirit-led guys were speaking about. And we were in a minority, trust me. But I thought, this is great. The name of Christ is going forth. And we found great joy in that. And that's what David is saying here in verse 13. When I'm restored, I will teach others these men, including us, and, and Connie, of course, we've been restored. And we know the way out of the prison of fleshly living. It's through Jesus Christ. It's not teaching me how to, to work. Oh, that's a good thing. I, after we receive the Lord, then these other things begin to start showing fruit. Yes, they're necessary. Or we can use a house, a house perhaps, or a bag lunch to get someone's attention and say, hey, now that I've bought you lunch, it's my turn to speak. That's all fine and dandy. That's good. But just by handing out lunches or handing out tents isn't going to change anybody's life. Oh, it will for a week or so, or even for a day. Like you give them a bologna sandwich. Sure, that'll satisfy them for a day. But without the Lord, 
they're going back to that fleshly lifestyle. And that's what David is saying. Hey, when as I am restored, then I will teach transgressors your ways. And so pray for us because this cops and clergy is a new thing that they want to meet every couple of months. And so I pray that we get more spirit-filled men of the churches in the community showing up. I'll be honest with you, there were a lot of ladies there. It was great. But one of the guys said, and he was right, he was thinking, you know, these ladies are representing different fellowships. And, and one of the guys says, hey, where's the men of your church? Madam, I love you, but where's the pastor of your church? Why are you here? I mean, great, you're, I'm, we're glad you're here. But where's the guys? And it was right. And I started wondering that myself. Where are the guys? And so pray for the, us in that regard. But anyway, we had a good time. But again, David is saying, I want to teach. Restore me so I can give that reference and I can give my testimony that others will be converted likewise. And that's what these men, all of us men were saying last night. You've got to have a relationship with Christ. If we want anything to change in this city, it's Jesus first, then housing, then food, etc., etc. All those other things will come. But they've at least got to come hand in hand. But of course, the county just wants to bring the material and think, think that, you know, put a little magic pixie dust on it and everything changes. We know that doesn't work. We understand that. It's a tricky scenario. We've got to be careful. We've got to walk circumspectly. But David is saying, hey, give me this opportunity. Deliver me from my guilt, verse 14, my guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall follow, shall, shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice. Remember the chapter we just looked at? Don't just casually roll a sacrifice into my presence thinking that you're doing anything for me. You do not, you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. If that's truly what you wanted primarily, Lord, I would bring it. But you don't desire that. You do not delight in the burnt offering, again, as suggested in, in chapter 50. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart. These things, O oh God, you will not despise. This is what you want. This is what you desire. You desire a broken spirit, a, a broken and a contrite heart, along with thanksgiving, as we saw in chapter 50. Verse 18, do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Lord, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and, and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. When we come with the proper heart, Lord, you'll receive and finally, Psalm 52, this is simply the end of the wicked and the peace of the godly. This is written to the chief musician, a contemplation of David when Doeg the Edomite went and told King Saul and Doeg said to King Saul, David has gone to the house of Ahimelech. Now I want you to jot this down. First Samuel, I know we're going a little long, so just stick with me. 1 Samuel 22, jot that down for later, re later reference. 1 Samuel 22, technically verse 22. But Ahimelech, we find out, was a priest. And when David was on the run from King Saul, King David went to Ahimelech, which Ahimelech was the head priest, the, the chief priest of, 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 of many other priests in the area. It is thought that the tabernacle was probably in the possession of Ahimelech at this time, perhaps. But yet Ahimelech, the, the chief priest, had others around him. And so it was a, a little community of holy men, is what I'm trying to say. Of holy men, men that loved the Lord. And David, while on the run from Saul, 
ran into Ahimelech and came to Ahimelech, the godly man, and said, would you help me? And Ahimelech was a little curious, thinking, David, I know you. You're under the authority of Saul. But the Spirit of God told Ahimelech, basically, leave David alone. And David said, I just need help. My men and I, we need help. And I've got, I'm undercover right now. Please, would you assist us? And Ahimelech, the priest, said, I will. I will help you, David. I know who you are. Doeg, the Edomite, was a man that hated God, hated God's people. And Doeg, the Edomite, told King Saul, hey, you know David, the guy you're chasing? Well, I know right where he's at. Doeg, the rat, the tattletale, said, oh, King Saul. You know, in my day, you ratted out, you had disfigured body features the next day. I mean, bad. Not good. I mean, that's not a, you know, a pleasant story. But the fact, you know, I just, ugh, doeg, I want to. Hey, I know where King David is. You can go get him. Let's pick up at verse 1 and we'll quickly get through. Verse 1, why do you boast in evil? David is, is just writing, O mighty man. The goodness of God endures continually. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. David goes on, you love evil more than good. You love lying rather than speaking righteousness, Selah. When Doag went and reported to Saul, Saul was so enraged at the priest and the community of priests, Saul told his men, I want you to kill all these religious men. Remember, Saul, the Spirit of God was removed from Saul. He, he was losing his mind. And so Saul commanded his men to kill this community. And thankfully, Saul's men said, you know what, Saul, we're loyal to you, but this is, you're going too far. This is wrong. We've been chasing David. We're not quite sure why. But for you to tell us to kill Jehovah's men, Yahweh's men, we're not going to do it. So thank God for that, right? So here comes Doeg. And Saul says, and, and Doeg says, hey, if your guys won't kill him, I'll do it. Because I hate these religious men. And Saul said, fine. And so Doeg goes in, just like these heroes walk into a church with a firearm and start shooting people, thinking that they're doing something for whatever, but there couldn't be anything more cowardly in the world. And that was Doeg's position. And so King David is just, he's just stunned after he, he had left and then he had gotten word that this had happened. He's just David is just like, are you kidding me? These defenseless men of peace, you just went in and hacked them up because they were serving me? And David was just, he was just crushed. And he continues in verse four, you love all devouring words, you deceitful tongue. You evil man, David is saying. God shall likewise destroy you forever. Hey, Doeg, there's no hope for you. There's no hope, David is proclaiming. God will destroy you forever. He shall take you away and pluck you out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. Oh, dwell on that for a minute. Selah. David is just astounded. The righteous also shall see and fear. In other words, the righteous will see, Lord, the Lord's judgment, and they will know that God reigns, along with the pagan. They shall see in fear and shall laugh at him, saying, oh, hey, here is the man who did not make God his strength, this Doag the Edomite. But this Doag trusted in the abundance of his riches. Saul made this man very wealthy after he carried out his evil task. He trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. 
But then David con concludes, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever, just as he had cried out in the chapter before. Lord, send your tender mercies. Yet your will be done. Your will be done, Lord. Verse 9, as we close, I will praise you forever because you have done it. And in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name for your name is good. Praise the Lord. Thanks for being patient. If I could ask the worship team to come join me. We have so much to be thankful for. So much. And I just wanted to allow us to reflect on these psalms tonight. They make so much sense. I mean, it's the righteous and the unrighteous is all it is. Righteous, nothing by our own efforts or activities. We are righteous because we believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, period. In that, though, we respond with our sacrifices, just as David made clear tonight. You don't want us just to roll our sacrifices up and kick them on the altar and say, okay, I punched my time card. But yet with a broken heart and a contrite spirit and a spirit of thanksgiving, we come and we say, Lord, this is yours. Would you take it? And this weekend, we just come together in a spirit of thanksgiving for what the Lord has done for us. As we made a little video this, this afternoon and put it on Facebook, we are thankful. I mean, the simple fact that we're living here in, in America, that is something to be thankful for. The whole world is clamoring to come to the United States. And we're here. And so we can be thankful for that. And naturally, we're thankful for our salvation, of course. But there are so many things to be thankful for this, this whole year, but we get to really focus on this weekend, if you will. So once again, if you have nowhere to go tomorrow, Connie and I would love to meet you next door in the youth area. Doors open at 1 p.m. If you've got nowhere to go, come on down. If you want to bring something, bring something. If you don't want to, don't. Because there's going to be more than enough, as there always, always is. But the main thing is, is, is if you would like to join us, we would love to have you. For the rest of us that are going elsewhere and heading out, be safe. Allow, allow the Lord to shine through you. And sometimes we get in some of these environments that are a little challenging. But make sure you just continually ask the Lord to refresh you and, and, to, and to renew you throughout the afternoon, throughout the day, throughout the evening. And He will. You know that. So we're grateful. Join us by standing. And Lord, as we meditate on Your goodness, we consider all this in heaven too. We know truly, Lord, that one day in your house is better than a thousand elsewhere.